Bonjour. Oh, that was Nifty Cod. My name is George Martin, and I'm listening to the Ancestral Food Pot. Welcome to the Ancestral Food Podcast, episode number three. And on this episode, we'll be covering the traditional corn making process. And the gentleman who taught me how to make traditional corn, George Martin. Well, I'll go ahead and give a little background information on Mr. Martin, and then we'll go over the process of making the traditional Madaman and the teaching of the story of corn. So George Martin grew up in the Whitefish community, La Couture Ojibwe Reservation near Hayward, Wisconsin. He served 10 years in the United States Air Force during the Korean War and Vietnam War. He is well known throughout the Great Lakes region and the Midwest as a traditional dancer, head veteran, and has a wealth of knowledge about Anishinaabe dance, traditions, and protocols. George practices traditional peyote stitch beadwork making ceremonial dance sticks, canes, and rattles which can be seen at powwows across the U.S. and Canada. He and wife Sydney spend much of their time traveling to Anishinaabe communities far and wide to attend ceremonial functions, teach at cultural events, participate in Anishinaabe activities, and to visit with friends and relations. George was featured on the TV show My Grandmother's Ravioli, teaching how to make traditional Anishinaabe corn soup. He has been practicing and sharing the artistry of peyote stitch beadwork, cultural culinary artistry of corn soup making for over 65 years. George turned 82 years old on December 2nd, 2017. He and his wife, Sydney, have been married for 55 years. They raised four children and have made their home in Hopkins, Michigan. I have had the pleasure of meeting quite a few of George Martin's children. I have met Pumpkin Shinataquat, uh, which is a very uh, knowledgeable about Anishinaabe traditions also. His daughter, Shannon Martin, which is the director of the Zibwing Museum and Cultural Center for the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe. And also I had the pleasure of cooking with Carly Shinataquat, which is Pumpkin's daughter, um, at the Great Lakes Intertribal Food Summit. I know she has absorbed a great deal of knowledge from her grandpa and grandma and the traditional Anishinaabe cooking techniques and traditions. So that was the brief history of George Martin. He's a a wonderful gentleman, very nice to talk to. Um, I love to pick his brain every time I get to sit down and talk to him. Next, I'll go over the the traditional Madaman corn teachings. So this is going to be a brief summary of uh, all the steps to making the corn. It's a quite a process to uh, taking the current off the cob. That's a hard process. Uh, definitely get some calluses after doing that. But to begin with, you have to have the corn. And the corn has to be dry. Uh, the recommended drying period is one year from harvest. So you pick it in the fall, and all winter long, you dry it out and store it. And come spring, summer, it should be uh, nice and dry for you. But there is an important process to uh, making um, this corn. To make this traditional corn, you have to use hardwood ashes. You can only use hardwood ashes because ashes from softwood, coal, leaves, trash, etc. are always taboo because the madaman will never separate from its shell. Using ashes from these sources will never cook up the madaman, no matter how long you boil it. I I cannot stress the importance of this teaching. Our ancestors, a thousand years ago, were geniuses in chemical, horticulture, botanical, agriculture, astronomical, and meteorological sciences to invent and perfect this process. George says never to make this a madaman during a thunderstorm. The electricity in the air and the barometric pressure combine to make a negative environment for the spirit of the madaman to be born and dance. Thunderstorms stop the madaman spirit's path to giving us its nourishment or life. 
George also says sometimes birds, chipmunks, and other little creatures come to the madame and drying screen to help themselves. Um, he says just let them take their fill as the creator has instructed the Anishinaabek people that the madame belongs to the creatures as much as it belongs to us. The Creator and Mother Earth gave Madonna to us to all nourish our hearts, minds, and spirits. So don't shoo the creatures away. Enjoy them, he says. We are told to acknowledge them or to talk to them in our own way, for they may be an ancestor that has come to visit with us as we're carrying on an ancient and sacred endeavor. George also says, uh, cook Madonna with only a good and happy heart and mind. Definitely a positive attitude. I've always, always told that. You know, your 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 the way you act and feel goes into your cooking. So you always want to be upbeat and positive. That's why food is so important for us to gather around and share because we're passing on our love of something we prepared that's going to make someone healthy and happy. So you always choose a time to prepare your uh, madame when you're not stressed out or on a time constraint. When you bring negativity or rush the process, the madame abs- will absorb these feelings and those who eat the, that particular batch will act the same way. This teaching applies to all the preparation of all feast foods and just any any food you prepare in your life. I was always told cooking comes from the heart, not a measuring cup. And I, and I, I truly believe that. Unless you're baking, you know, then baking is definitely a science. So another thing George says is never leave the madame alone or unattended while working with it. Be grateful and pleased to be with madame and her spirit. Take care of it. The madame spirit knows her life is in your hands and wants you to do well. Treat her in a respectful and loving manner. Lovingly interact with her for she is a tender and wise spirit. Another important step that George mentions is never store dried madaman in an airtight container. Store your processed madaman in a paper sack, covered basket, burlap bag, or even in a cardboard box. Any receptacle made of natural or porous materials. Some elders say that madaman must be able to breathe until it has been consumed because her spirit is still alive. The best storage container is a black ash basket. Um, actually, I store my corn in. I have like this giant pencil holder that's like a wire mesh. Eight inch circle, probably about... 10 inches high, so I can fit quite a few cups in that, and I just put that in it and put it up in my pantry and shake it around a few, look at it, and make sure nothing's really happening to it. So if you're storing your madaman for a year or more, store it in a cool, dry, and quiet place and occasionally stir it with your hands. Uh, another important step is to enjoy your special time with the whole madaman process. Working with the spirit of madaman to provide sustenance for your family, friends, and or community is a blessing and honor process is more than providing nourishment for the body. It is medicine for your body, mind, and spirit. When Madame is prepared in this good way, it becomes healing for you. It is very good medicine. So that is uh, the slight process of steps uh, he says to go about making this uh, corn in the proper way. So I highly recommend if you ever have a chance to take one of his, his teachings um, of making traditional corn to to attend that it's very informational it's a long process you got uh do it over a fire um the big cauldron you use uh water and hardwood ashes oak preferably there is a certain ratio out there for you to do it and you got to boil the corn down in those ashes for a couple hours and you know, Mr. Martin showed us what to look for when the little eye of the corn kernel pops out and the, you can see the, the shell is starting to separate a little bit, and it's usually done. So it, it took it took quite a while, two two hours or so, for that process to happen. I mean, it might even take longer sometimes. depends on your environment, where your fire is at, and uh, that kind of stuff. Then after it's it's cooked, then you got to drain it. Then uh, George had this big screen rack that we dumped it outside. Then we took uh, our garden hose and we sprayed down the corn and rubbed it over the drying rack and got all the ashes and you know, made it clean and uh, sifted it out. And then once it, it was sifted, then you got to dry it. So he uh, he uh, honored me with some uh, some of that corn that we made during the class to take back to my elders at my work and uh, cook them up soup with it and to have it for a little while. So that for the drying process, whew, it was. I'm thinking all of two weeks for it to be completely dry till I was comfortable of putting it away in my container and uh, storing it. So, uh, I know the elders really appreciate it. Um, it was very, we were very, very grateful that Mr. Martin gave us that corn because it is quite the process. So some of the necessities that you need to make corn is, of course, the madaman. And it's got to be on the cob, stored it for at least one winter, hanging from the ceiling. And I've seen people where they uh, braid it up and make it look real nice, and they hang it. And they also put rodent 
uh, deflectors on the bottom of them to keep the rodents from climbing up. And You know, because they have that. Like Mr. Martin says, they're entitled to the corn as just as much as us. Uh, the next part is hardwood ashes. You can go around and make sure you could have, have good, clean access to ashes that, that no one's burning any trash or, you know, plastics in their fire pit. Uh, you want good, clean ashes because you will be uh, assuming this. So uh, I think it's quite remarkable that our ancestors thought of this stuff way back then to take, you know, ashes and mix with the corn and that uh, it will it will release some of the nutrients and allow our body to uh, to absorb the nutrients from the, the corn. So I, I, I really enjoyed hearing um, stories about how the Europeans tried taking the corn back to their, their countries once they discovered it here in Turtle Island and that they created a famine and malnourishment because they, they missed one very, very important technique that they were not worried about and didn't think that was important to mix that that lye with that corn and they created a, a you know a malnourishment generation by doing that and learned their lesson and I think it's their it's the, it's the creator coming back to us saying you know you got know the corn and be the corn and feel the corn to really get everything out of it. So you also need a little sifter for the ashes. So when you get your ashes you can sift out the, any big chunks of unburnt wood. You also need a big kettle, cast iron, enamel, or stainless steel. Measuring cup, wooden stir spoon or paddle, outdoor stove or outdoor fire, water from the hose, a table, a large colander, and of course a drying screen. So that's some of the necessities of the corn. That's a little background of the corn. I'm not going to go into the whole detail because I would really appreciate if you guys took the time and went down and took a class with Mr. Martin. Um, so just so the the teaching of the corn and his process and getting the feel for it, feeling how appreciative you are for that corn when someone gifts you that corn, or you or you gotta buy buy the corn because you know it's quite a process and they took they took their time and energy and their love to make this corn a very important nourishment. After this class, we also made a soup during this time. So it's a very traditional, uh, simple soup, um, just with water, corn, uh, a little pepper, onion pork if you want, a little bacon or pork roast was put into it to make it taste just a little better. And then you cook it and the corn will puff up and come out of its shell and look real beautiful and you just want to gobble the whole pot of soup down yourself. This podcast was a great honor for me because Mr. Martin is a wonderful gentleman and I can't wait to sit down and learn some more from him and be able to pass it on to uh, my kids and my community. So thank you and uh, also um, don't forget to check out my website. Feel free to leave any comments on my YouTube page. I love to have any suggestions for upcoming episodes or any other major issues I could tackle out there. Um, I know there's a lot of of stuff happening and food sovereignty, people having food initiatives, and what's really stuck in my head is, you know, truly, truly to be sovereign, to be a sovereign nation as a Saginaw Chippewa nation, you have to have your language and you have to have your food. Those are two vital things I think that we need to start working on and that will make us a stronger tribe for generations to come. So thank you, and until next time, may you witch. Well, hello, this is Sam Anglin here, another day at the Great Lakes Intertribal Food Council Summit. And I'm just going to sit here and talk to Mr. George Martin, one of our head veterans that always comes to our powwow at the Saginaw Chippewa. And it's a great honor to talk to him, and I'm just going to ask him a few questions. Why do you think ancestral food is important? It's like a medicine. It heals your body. It heals whatever Whatever, whatever your body needs is there. So it gives us what we what we need. That's right. The Creator's always had a plan for us with that too. Right? Oh, he, that's his plan. Yes, yes. The plan that he had. Yes. And what is one of your favorite foods to eat? Traditional foods to eat. Manoman. Manoman. All right. Man. And I was fortunate enough to take your corn making class, and that was really, really interesting to learn that process, and yeah. especially the story behind it. Oh. So that was really interesting. And so one day I'd like to sit down and talk to you about that story. It was a really honor for that. What is my memory you have that, of eating a meal with a relative? What was you know one of their favorite dishes they cooked that you liked so much that you still remember today? Still remember today. When I was a teenager... Riding to my uncle and aunt's place, which is about 15 miles away, riding my bike over there, and going out to the sugar bush. And every morning she'd have pancakes, pancakes, peanut butter, and and, and 
maple syrup. syrup. Oh, the pe- I love peanut butter and <laughs> my pancakes. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. I won't ever forget that. Well, good deal, good deal. That's that's quite the memory. Cause we, you know, we all can relate to food. We all, you know, if uh, we smell a certain smell or we see something that triggers us that, that happy memory, and uh, it's uh, very important. Now, uh, could you lightly, briefly just explain the corn story? Do you have a little bit of time for that? Yeah. How it came to Anishinaabe. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a, it came a long time ago when the first Your man walked on Mother Earth. Uncle Winnie Uncle Winnie Bougie, the trickster, he, he could see into the future. He, he could turn into any animal he wanted. He was, he was that powerful. And that's when he seen that. He, he was walking through the woods in the springtime. He was admiring creation. And he came to this clearing and he looked across. He seen this image across the field, the meadow or the field. And it looked like, like him. So he went out to the, walked to the center and the image started coming towards him. And when they met, he said he wanted to fight him. And when the Bougie, he, he don't turn down nothing. You get you gain for anything, they'll be popular. They fought all day, tearing up the ground in big chunks. And that evening sunset come, they said, well, we'll be quick for today, come back tomorrow. So the next morning he was there, and the same, that same guy was there, duking it out again and fighting. And pretty soon they were in the woods, just tearing up brush, just pulling in. And again, again that evening, the sunset, the guy said, well, well, come back tomorrow. We'll finish it off. we we'll rest. Next morning, he came back, he looked over, and the guy was dressed. Just like a fancy dancer, or a grass dancer, or all in different colors. Just beautiful. And I don't want to fight you now, you know, it's all right. So they really fought. And, Tore his, tore his <laughs> outfit all up. Parts laying all over the field. Different colors. And at sunrise or sunset again, he said, Well, you, I'll talk quits. He said, You beat me. I can't go no more. But I want you to come back here next fall. Next fall, I want you to come back. So when the bougie we left, it was all summer long. And Ball came, you know, I gotta go back to that field. He told me to go back. So we went back there and he looked at me, just the whole field of corn. And all the mm-hmm. corn was in different colors. Huh. That's interesting. That's really cool. That's how we get, we get that corn. Indian corn. At, Indian corn. 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 Yes, that, that barefoot corn. Yeah. And, uh, Man, I got, when you gave us that little bit, I took some up to my dad. He's going to grow it up there for us, and uh, we're going to do it in a separate plot. And I had just, I had a couple, I had just a little handful left, and everybody that sees that corn, they're like, where'd you get that at? Where'd you get that <laughs> corn? And I tell them, they're like, oh, my gosh. They're like, they're like, take care of that one, they yeah. said. That's a special one, they said. So uh, I'm definitely going to take that one to heart. And um, my elders really enjoyed that we corn. enjoyed it. Oh, yeah, and we still got probably about three more batches I can stretch out of it yeah. so that will ask me to hopefully I can get my own yeah um, but it, it's been a great pleasure Mr. Martin yeah. it's um you're a vast tool of knowledge you know you got so much knowledge and it's just remarkable and you know I always uh, my grandma passed away when I was young oh. she died in 78 uh, my grandma was Mabel Pelcher from um, up in Clare we lived oh. in Clare so I didn't live on the reservation, so I didn't really have a good connection. Yeah. So I, I take it upon myself just to learn all the knowledge I can and where I came from and uh, what my purpose is. And yeah. I, think, I think cooking food, learning more of a traditional way of cooking, and passing it on is I think that's my I think that's my that's me. I really take great pride in my job, yeah. you know, cooking for the elders and I really that, that goes into the food and I'm creating good medicine for people. Yeah, you are. You know, cuz I got good vibes, you know, I, I, I always try to do my best. Yeah. Um, so like again, Mr. Martin, it was a great pleasure and I appreciate your time. Miigwech. Oh, Miigwech.